Roddick was one in the nation in 12s. I'm glad you're sitting down. You ready for this? He lost to Drew Brees. It's unbelievable. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode here on Youth Inc., uh, presented by Audiorama. And as always, our friends and Invisalign. Um, we had a quiet, a quiet sports weekend in the Olsen house. It was Memorial Day weekend. We actually had no tournaments. We have a rule in our house if I have any control over it. So not all the teams, but a lot of the teams that we coach, um, I have a rule. We don't play on Easter. We don't play on Mother's Day. We don't play on Memorial Day. And we don't play on 4th of July. So we went down to the beach as a family, got away, um, and, and just had a nice break, you know, just to get away. It seems like every weekend we have something that either puts us on the road, traveling or practice or games tournaments. So we had a really low key Olson family sports weekend. So the update is very boring, but now we get into full stretch. Uh, both boys are wrapping up, um, baseball. I do have to report my daughter's soccer team, the Panthers, um, bunch of third grade girls. They are incredibly adorable and cute. And, um, they won their soccer championship. That was a couple weeks ago. So I'm a little late reporting that, but she would be mad. So, uh, but we are going to finish school and then we are going to go into summer baseball and, uh, try to tie a bow on it before, you know, right after 4th of July and enjoy the rest of the summer. Um, talking about summer, you know, it seems like we're right in the middle. It seems like tennis is now a, a summer sport. You know, we, we all, you know, you watch Wimbledon and you watch all the big events and, and right now the French open is going on and, and everyone's waiting to see is, you know, Djokovic and Nadal. And, you know, you want to see all the primetime guys. So what better timing than our ho than our guest that we have today? I, I remember just a few months back watching King Richard and, and watching Will Smith's character, of course, Venus and Serena Williams father, uh, Richard Williams. And, and he meets this really interesting character who comes out to Compton to watch the girls. And, and next thing you know, he flies them back to his, to his Academy in Florida and takes them under his wing. And, and of course the rest is history. So we, we are fortunate to get Rick Macy, the man, the myth, the legend. He is still working 12 hour shifts a day, seven days a week. The energy, when you hear his podcast, the energy just jumps off the screen. So they have the opportunity um, as, as summer's approaching and, and all of us are going to tune in to, to all the major tennis events to have a chance to speak to a guy that not only is training, you know, the Williams sisters and Andy Roddick and Maria Sharapova, you know, some of the most world-class names that, that are household names. He's also having kids as young as four, five, six years old dropped off at his academy and hearing him talk us through that. So I, I think you guys are going to find this both eye-opening, interesting. Um, Rick is just a really fascinating guy with great stories. And, and again, just a really, really valuable tool and, and, and a voice to continue to further our message and mission here on You Think. So um, as always, um, Invisalign is the number one doctor trusted brand having transformed over 12 million smiles over the past 25 years. Invisalign gives you the opportunity to make a trusted decision that can help build confidence for your child. Find a trusted provider at Invisalign.com or talk to your doctor. So now please enjoy this conversation here on You Think with seven-time USPTA National Coach of the Year, Rick Macy. Rick, thank you so much for... Uh, joining us here on you think no I'm, I'm glad to be here it's gonna be a lot of fun i'm fired up and uh gonna share a lot of good stuff with all the listeners well i appreciate it rick so i, I mentioned all those really famous names that all of our viewers all know off the top of their head their household names of course at the top of the list uh the the williams sisters uh, serena and, and venus but before we get into coaching at the elite level you know our big focus here on you think is what are the best practices of developing youth athletes and whether it's for coaches or for parents. So I want to start there. Um, I, I know you've coached kids as young as four, five years old, their parents bring them to you for lessons and they say, Hey, make my kid a pro, make my kid, you know, a, a college athlete. T talk to us a little bit about what that process is like. You know, you, you get handed a young child and it's your job to develop them into the divisions of hopefully themselves, but also their families. Talk, talk to us a little bit about what that journey and, and approach is like in your eyes. Well, for, first off, Greg, it's a great question. And especially in my situation, you could imagine everybody has the next. All right. Like even a month ago, someone said, I got my daughter's better than Serena. And then I had to say jokingly at what, you know, yeah. so they got a <laughs> kick out of that one. So no, listen, 
the cornerstone for all this with kids, you got to make it fun. I'm, I'm just, I'm just telling you, that's the cornerstone. It has to be fun, but you can get more out of kids when it's fun. They're not even tired anymore when it's fun. They're going to listen more when it's fun, not messing around babysitting. That's a whole different deal. And that's the art of coaching of how to push the buttons. But the parents that go in there with these young kids, like it's Rocky Balboa, you know, it, the world's coming to an end tomorrow. That never works. Never works. You got to be serious, but you better make it fun. It's a long-term process. It's junior development, no matter what sport. You know, at 17, you're going to decide, am I going to the University of Miami or am I going to turn pro or whatever you're going to do? Uh, that's where this is. But everybody's in the moment. But fun is the cornerstone um, and getting great fundamentals. Unfortunately, you know, the muscle memory can get baked in extra crispy, even how you throw a ball or catch a ball, yep. you know, or hit a ball. And it's tough to rewire their, their reflexes. So getting great coaching. And that's in the eye of the beholder at a young age is critical also. Yeah, that's what, one of the nice things about coaching young kids is you don't have to undo a lot of bad habits, right? They're, they're, they're new. They're kind of a fresh mold of clay that, you know, you don't have to undo someone else's bad coaching or, or some bad habits they've developed along the way. So I, that's a really interesting take. You have a, really, a quote that I've seen you use a few times that I find really interesting. You said, I don't just change grips and strokes. I change lives. Like how much off the court impact you take as being such a prominent part of your job and your role. Of course, you're teaching kids how to be better, better tennis players. When we're talking about youth athletics and youth sports and, and, and having parents entrust you with their child, how much pride do you take in all of the non tennis related stuff that you're trying to teach these kids and instill in them as they go up through the ranks and, and get older? Yeah, no, to me, that's the, uh, uh, that's probably been my greatest impact. You know, it's not the people that have become number one or the eight Grand Slam champions or all these kids that have won the national titles. You know, that's the window dressing, the ones that maybe clean their room better or I've helped them get off drugs or they do their homework. You know, and I don't try to do that in the teaching, Greg. It just is part of the entree that happens, the life lessons that they're getting. And that's why it's really important to have your kid around people who are role models and father figures, not just someone who's been there, done that and knows what the heck's going on, you know, and it's probably one of the main reasons why, you know, Richard and I teamed up. He saw more there than just uh, a guy that uh, put Capriati's game together. So no, that means more to me than anything. And when people come back, because what I still do, to, what I still do to this day is I lead by example. I just outwork the competition. You know, I just, I still outwork everybody, even though I don't have to. Like people will say, why do you pick the balls up? And I said, well, they're not going to jump back in the basket. I better pick <laughs> them up. Or, why do you answer your own phone? I said, because it's ringing, you know? So I still, and when you lead by example, it's even more powerful without saying anything. You know, all these things that, that I haven't sat down on the tennis court in 30 years. You know, I'm the first one there. And all these things, a lot of parents just want their people around that positive energy that's always looking at this thing in a different through a different lens. You know, the parents that know there's more to football or baseball or tennis, the game of life, you're going to be doing that a lot longer. So but they go hand in hand, how to handle problems, how to treat others, how to hail, handle failure. And so your question is great because. Um, I don't try to do that, but that's just kind of how I've always been wired myself. And it comes across loud and clear in the teaching. And that's why I can extract greatness out of people because no parent even knows what's inside their kid. And I just keep going till I get more, one more, one more. I have a famous quote, one more, one more. You get that? Spelled differently. <laughs> I knew you would get that. So I like oh, that. Great, great question. That'd be great on a shirt. I'm sure yeah, that's on, I'm sure that's somewhere hanging up in your office. I'm sure it it's is. somewhere. <laughs> I love that. And and along those same lines, and and this is something that you know in in you know in in team sports, baseball, basketball, you know, um, stick and ball type sports. But I always find it even more prevalent in Olympic sports, tennis, golf, where there's this balance between 
immediate success and immediate affirmation and this real long-term journey to what's this long, you know, this end game. And, and in your case, you're getting people that are bringing their kids there as in, you know, in elementary school, you know, maybe m- middle, middle school. And, and the, the opportunity to turn pro or the opportunity to go to college is not happening until 17, 18 years. In some cases, that's 10 years away. Like it, it's very similar. We, we spoke with Sean Johnson, the Olympic gold medalist, and we talked to her about this and how to balance the day-to-day grind and the year-by-year grind when maybe your ultimate goal is very far away. Like, how do you approach that with such young kids where, yes, they all want immediate success, they want immediate affirmation, they want to win local matches, they want to win on the circuit, but the end game is, hey, I need you to be good today, but I really need you to be your best in five years. Like, that's a long journey that's very unique to Olympic, tennis, golf, can you speak a little bit about what that approach is physically, but also I would imagine the mental component? Yeah, absolutely. You know, people, um, yeah, everybody wants to win now. They want to talk about their kid, the parents living through the kid. They want to be able to have that trophy. You know, I, I get all that stuff. And like I uh, tell her by it's, it's junior development, not junior final destination. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. Um, you got to build a game. And I tell everybody, you got to process the process. You know, did I get better today or worse? All this is about, about getting better. Okay. It's not about how many tournaments you won. I've had kids go, I've had one boy, he won every national in the 12 singles and doubles. Okay. He was like, he would torture everybody. He had a great pro career, 82 in singles, 11 in the world in doubles, nothing to sneeze about, but he wasn't Agassi Chang or Sam Purse or any of those guys. So what I'm trying to say is, um, I, you got to build a game and I'm fortunate because who I've coached and I've built their games at a young age and I created that atmosphere to extract greatness. So I educate the parents on, you got to build weapons. You're going to miss balls now because you're immature. You're going to miss balls now because you're four eleven. you know, you're going to be, you know, I taught Riley Opelka. I mean, the guy's seven feet tall when I had him at 12, you know, <laughs> I thought he'd be six, six. This is what I'm trying to say. You're going to cover more real estate when you're older, bigger, stronger, faster. The tennis court at a young age is like a football field. When you're 17, it's like a ping pong table. The whole thing changes. And I educate the parents. You miss that because you're two inches too short, 10 pounds heavier. You'd have got there smiling and you'd rip a winner. So it's just constant. Today's important. But I, I never play for today, Greg. Never. You know? Never. It's always about the future and building weapons. And you grow into that game. You grow into the game. And that's why I've had so much success, especially on the girls' side, because there's not as much physicality as the guys that uh, they're playing like pros at 12 years old. Then they grow into it and uh, they, they got a pro game at a young age. And a lot of people can see that. And so, but that's an education that you got to do. Um, uh, with the parents and they're going to lose. And the more you fail, you're going to succeed. If you're doing the right thing, it's all about positive intentions. Speak a little bit more about the communication with the parents. Cause I I think that's such an important point you bring up and we, we see it with our teams. I mean, obviously I'm a parent and there's times where I could probably look back and say, all right, I probably didn't handle that situation the right way, whether it was with my own kid or with my kid's coach or whoever it is. Speak a little bit about how do you communicate that with parents, right? Everyone's dropping their kid off and they're saying, I'm paying you, Rick Macy. I'm making all these personal sacrifices. My kid needs to be the best 12 year old in the world or the country, whatever it is. And maybe if they're not, how do you continue to reinforce that? Okay. You're not there at 12 because of, you know, X, Y, and Z reasons, but maybe at 14, 16, 18, the vision is clear. Like how do you earn their trust? that they can say, all right, I'm going to make this commitment to you at 10 years old and you have this eight year plan. And if in year two, maybe we're not seeing the, you know, the end result, my kid's not developing. There's other kids in the Academy. He can't be like, how do you communicate that? I know you, your reputation obviously speaks for itself and that probably goes a long way, but like, what is that daily communication? Not only with the kid, but with their parents. No, it's, it's huge. And I, I wish they dropped the kids off and left, but they don't do that anymore. Maybe back in the day, <laughs> they don't do that. They're, it's like Little League Baseball or soccer. They're there on the fence. That 
great. That's them out there playing indirectly. That's them. And you, you know, you, you got kids, you know, the drill. I mean, and you've been there, done that. So with you, it's different. These parents that I've had that played high level sports or played the Olympics or they play pro, they got the temperature better than the ones that maybe don't have that experience. And I just tell them, how did you feel when you missed the ball at 12? I didn't even play. Say they don't know what it's like. Okay. And so I got to talk to them about that. And it's a constant, like, you know, she's just immature. The brain doesn't reason yet. You know, your brain's not fully developed. Um, this one's winning a little more because they're quicker and they're more mature. They have a different family environment. Maybe they have more, you know, discipline in the family. Maybe these people are more competitive the way they were brought up, like Venus and Serena, you know. So I, I just educate this. I talk to the parents all the time. And th I, this is what I've always done. And it's been the best thing where some coaches, it's their way or the highway, get the parents out of here. That never works because when they start losing, they're going to someone down the road. You know, yeah, that's, yeah. they got to blame someone. You ain't going home to eat with them when the door closed. I mean, you're on the other side. So um, that's it. And, you know, you just keep motivating. And they always say their kid plays better when they win. And the ones, that's why I love Richard Williams. They didn't play any tournaments. They didn't play any tournaments, Greg. And think about it. That's not the blueprint because they knew how to compete. So I wasn't worried about that. So if we want to really think about it, there was every Monday morning with Richard, it was like a piece of cake because we're not talking about the bad loss on Sunday. And then the blame game, you got to get better. We're talking Hingis, Steffi Graff, Martina. We're not talking this 12-year-old that beat her, you know, in Orlando over the weekend. We're not talking like that. So that's what I loved about that, the Williams thing. But in general, it's a, it's a slippery slope. You know, because some coaches teach the kids not to lose so they can win, so they can get more students to come and give them more money. And they think they're doing a good job. And I'm very honest about this. If you're lazy, I'm going to tell you you're lazy. And if you're a jackrabbit, I'm going to tell you you're a jackrabbit. You know, at the end, and if you're like a marshmallow, I'm going to tell you you're a marshmallow. And, you know, when you're great, I'm going to make a big deal about it. And when it's not good, I'll make a big deal about it. That way you got that balance. And I'm constantly educating the parents. And uh, that's how I get their belief. But it's a constant uh, uh, communication, even through text and, you know, emojis and gifts besides the verbal part. And yeah. it's just 24 seven this day because all the parents, as you know, their helicopter or their Velcro, they're right there. When you said drop them off, I, I don't, I've never seen that happen in a long time. <laughs> yeah, me either. <laughs> me either. And, and, and listen, I'm probably guilty of it too. And, and it's less that I need to live through my kid. I don't need my kids to be great at sports. The thing that I, the thing I ask out of my kids is if you tell me you want to be good at something, I will lay, I will show you what that means. I'm not going to do the work for you. I will do the work with you. If you ask me to go out there and practice, I'll be the first one out there. I'll stay until you're ready to be done. Like, there's nothing I won't do. But if you say you want to do this and we're going to make family sacrifice and we're going to make time and we're going to take time away from other things to help you along this journey, you need to be all in. Because if you're not all in, then you really don't want to do what you say you want to do. And that's when I get aggravated. So like that's the balance that we try to find in our family or amongst our parents. It's you don't need to be the best 10-year-old kid. In the, you need to be the best version of you. And if that means you're the 10th best kid, the 50th best kid, or maybe the best kid, that's secondary to me. I have a hard time seeing my kids, whether my own personal kids or the kids I coach, be lesser versions of themselves. That's where I really get frustrated and try to push them because I feel like our job as coaches is to bring out the best in everyone. It's not to make everyone Steffi Graf. It's to make everyone as good as humanly possible for what they're working with. No, well, well put. And that's exactly should be the blueprint or the roadmap for every uh, parent and coach, because at the end of the day, um, you're like you said, you either in or out. And I tell the kids all the time, uh, you don't care if you lose, you know, because he gets say the person gets mad all the time and they get frustrated and they beat themselves, which is part of the journey. That means they have passion. That's not all bad. I'd rather have that than someone that always goes and quits fighting. But 
if you you got to want to be there every point and that's the job of a coach and you know i'm fortunate to give examples of of venus and Srina and roddy he was <laughs> roddy was such a dog he was like a mosquito that wouldn't leave you alone i mean the guy just came back for more one of the best competitors ever maybe a little limited in some athletic things but he overachieved okay so i love that attitude and so this is what every be the best that you can be it's not a straight line people are going to win and lose for many reasons and this is where the coach has to come in and explain these things and then you just look at the people on the tour look how people respond when they make errors nadal better djokovic it's like greg it never happened you know i know football and basketball it's a little bit different but tennis you got 20 seconds to forget about it or you probably ain't going to win the next point it's mind control same with golf because it's individual and this is the hardest thing to do to forget and i teach the mental part so much um to these kids to put them in a bubble and it's tough it's very difficult but what you just said to me is what it's is what it's all about and uh some kids are naturally going to do this more and the coach should feel more challenged to help the ones that can't do it because everybody would like to have the perfect student and i tell the staff here the guys that work with me i said listen sure you want the kid that runs for every ball and says yes sir yes ma'am hey, listen that's the easy part it's the one that's negative that throws his racket you know that i look at it as a challenge yep. as a coach I don't look as an inconvenience. I want that guy because it's between me and me to try to win that battle. Can you teach young kids to be a dog? When you talk about Andy Roddick and Venus and Serena, an element to it, I believe, is definitely innate. I think some kids just have a more competitive fire, a more competitive drive to compete and to achieve and to fight than others. But I also believe, and just my experience dealing with young kids and growing up around it, I also feel like there's a little bit of a culture element too. If you put the kids in the right situations, you can bring out a more competitive spirit in them that maybe they didn't even know they had. What, what's your experience in that regard? When, when you talk about Roddick and, 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 the, and the Williams sisters, like they were just incredible elite competitors innately, but can you teach that? Can you bring that out of someone who might not be so just automatic? You know, a little bit. You're right. You can't you can't buy it at Publix or Walgreens. That ain't going to work. You know, you can't buy it over the Internet. A lot of it is genetic. A lot of it is environmental. You know, how, <laughs> how you're brought up and, you know, especially now, you know, people are a little more entitled or spoiled. And that's a hard balance, you know, because you want them to be a dog. But, you know, they're not. And then you go to the mall and buy them a Gucci bag or whatever. So you got to be real careful with this. But yeah, you can, the environment, I'm just telling you the environment, you, you, it, it can just bring you up. If everybody else is giving a hundred percent, you have a tendency to give as much as you can, but if everybody's screwing around or they're not there, I mean, competition brings it out of you. You don't even know it. You're just, you're just a creature uh, that you just, you just keep evolving and you don't even realize it. And that is huge. I mean, that's a huge thing besides the coach or whoever motivating you and the parent, but the environment has a lot, a lot to do with it. You have no idea. Um, and that's one of the, that's one of the things that, uh, at a crucial age I did for Venus and Serena from age 10 to 15, that environment was just so competitive and so uh, motivational, you know, like Venus always said, Rick, I was brainwashed to be number one. What a, what a statement that came from her, not me. And I didn't, I was just trying to make her serve better. You know, I wasn't looking at it like that. And that's a bit, but that's at the top level, but the environment is huge. Um, and that comes from the coach and the staff and, uh, everything else. And with young kids are so impressionable. One word, one word, Greg can change someone's life. I couldn't agree more with that. I, 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 we, we, we take the same approach with a lot of our teams and it's not for every family. Not every no. parent likes it. Not every parent thinks it's appropriate for the age and that's fine. I, I don't, I don't hold that. I don't be, you know, begrudge anyone who feels differently, but I just believe that these kids, you know, my older son, he's almost 11. You know, my, my twins are a little younger. They're, they're in third grade, they're nine. So it's a little bit different, but my older son's in fifth grade. He's about to be in middle school. 
Like, I believe that these kids, especially these young boys, like, they should be able to operate in hostile, competitive, intense environments. If we don't introduce them to those environments now, like when, when is the appropriate age? Is it high school? Is the first time they ever find themselves in a stadium jam packed with people screaming at them and coaches hollering at them and and other guys talking trash and intense situation. They're down by one. They're up by one. Should they be 18? And that's the first time they do it and their heads pop off. I, I say, no, why would we not teach kids to compete? Why would we not teach kids to fight back and to deal with adversity and come back stronger and deal with tough coaching and bounce back and find success? Like, I'm just such a big believer when it's time to put your arm around them and love them, you love them. But when it's time to put your foot up their ass and tell them they're not doing it right, there's time for that too. And whether they're 10, 12, 25, when it's the right time, it's the right time. I'm just a big believer in bringing out that competitive spirit in kids. And oftentimes the people who limit kids are the adults. Absolutely. No, you're, you're, you're spot on, you know, with this. I try to teach everybody to be the ultimate competitor, you know, run for every ball. And, you know, I go back to the Richard Williams. He would come up, he goes, Rick, I want VW to play someone today who doesn't like her, who cheats. Okay. And I want to use old balls. So she has to bend and dig them out. I mean, here's a guy who got it because he's from the other side of the track. Okay. And, you know, so where the other parent, they want, you know, new, they, they freak out if there's a bad call. And, you know, even when kids toss the ball up, I might yell, Hey, you know, I might, I distract them. You know, I do all this stuff and the parents that um, then I have to tell them sometimes this is the real world. You're going to the orange bowl and there's going to be, you know, 20 kids from China rooting for this girl. And you're there with your kid and they're clapping on double faults or whatever. And there's just, you gotta, you gotta be rough and tough and, that's what I saw in Venus and Serena. If Serena was like a little pit bull and they were so competitive. I saw this on the inside. That's why I took the chance and bankrolled it. It wasn't on the outside. On the outside, I mean, you know, it's like playing football. You know, you look at someone that you, <laughs> there's a lot of dogs on the inside. And those guys are the scariest, especially when they <laughs> smile at you. You know, then you're really <laughs> in trouble, those guys, you know. And this is what all coaches should do to be, be the best competitors. And, the, but the parents don't understand that. And it, th- that's the wild card. Cause you give me someone who just will compete. Okay. And I don't mind if they get upset and cry. Cause that means they're passionate. They're just all in. That is the hardest thing in my opinion, as to answer your question, man, to teach. Yep. That's the, that's the hardest thing. That's the, that's the wild card. We're all competitive. There's just, different levels to Jordan and Brady and yourself and all these other people. I mean, there's just a different, there's different levels, but the the people don't, they just turn on their TV set and say, Oh, I would have caught that pass in the end zone or, you know, I I, might serve better than that. (laughs) He's 10 in the world. They don't understand all the insanity between here and there. Of course that's that. So, but the parents, if, if, if I get a hold of them, I can teach that, that, that part of it. Um, it's like I tell them about Sharapova, uh, limited athletically. You hit the ball behind her, Greg, she would break her ankle. She controlled the center of the court, but she was in a bubble and she was just nasty. Even at 11, I had people that would beat her. She was this nasty competitor. And I went on the record, I said, she's limited, but this girl will be number one someday. And she was. Yeah. So, so let's talk about some of those. Uh, let's talk about some of those famous clients that you've had Sharapova. You've mentioned Eddie Roddick, of course, Venus and Serena Williams. G- give us, give us a story about what it was like. So you get an 11 year old Maria Sharapova. Like what is, what is her daily routine look like? What is, what is the morning and the afternoon? Is she, how many days a week? Like what do the lives of these future elite level competitors look like when you get them at a young age? Yeah, you know, they move from New York or New England and they're seven or eight, you know, basically what they do is, uh, you know, they'll have a private with me one on one every morning. OK, that's almost like mandatory that they have contact with me every day, one on one, whether I have a hitting partner and we're going over a lot of technical stuff, mental, strategic. So every day there's just building. I'm, I'm just building this player for the future. So that's one hour. 
Then they'll probably have one hour, whether it be in an academy with other people their level hitting and doing drills and stuff, or they might have, depending on the financial part of it, they might have their own hitting partner. They might want filet mignon instead of hamburger so they can afford to have an individual hitting partner. And then there's always group fitness, but the better ones always have individual fitness. They have their own individual fitness trainer. All right. And so this is usually two and a half hours in the morning, two and a half in the afternoon, because most of these kids go to school. Education's very important to all these. You know, they they're all pretty smart. You know, they're 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 in there. So it's usually four or five hours a day. There's always matches played in the afternoon. So it's a match a day, compete anybody, anytime, anywhere, keep score. So we at least have a, a blueprint. Okay. Cause you know, when the fans are in the stands that separates, you know, <laughs> great from good, you know, that's a whole different thing when the people are there. So usually a match, but every day they're hitting, you know, seven, 8,000 tennis balls and they're competing every Venus Serena played a match every day, every day. And, and they and, did and, Taekwondo ballet boxing. Uh, I had a professional boxer in the sand pit with them. I had, it was, and I didn't need to make them athletic. I didn't need to make them more competitive. That's why I took it over the rainbow because I wanted to check more boxes uh, because I put a lot into this and I knew they could, I thought they could be number one and transcend the, the sport. So, but and who's paying for all this? Huh? You say filet mignon, hamburgers, there's different levels, group, individual. Is this paid by the parents or some of these people you just recognize at a young age, like Venus and Serena, and you just bring them in to the fold? Like who's financing all of this? Yeah, well, it's usually the parents. It's very expensive. You know, the parents have to pay for it. And obviously- What would be know. like an annual commitment? If I brought you a 12-year-old kid, what, what do you think in a year, what am I spending a year on my kid? It depends how much time you want with Rick Macy because it's, it's 800 an hour. So it's, that's a whole different thing. They could be dropping easily a hundred thousand a year just wow. on training, and that doesn't count. Wow. Train, that doesn't count. That doesn't count travel. Okay, to go to the tournaments, to go play yeah, matches, you know, whatever. You go out of the country. You got it. If you start doing all that nonsense, so. Uh, but the Williamses was different, and I haven't really ever done that since. You know, where I bankrolled the whole thing, I took a chance. That was something different. Uh, people want to come, they pay. If they don't want to come, you know, then yeah. they go somewhere else and or they do group training. But at the end of the day, uh, you're going to get better by having someone that knows what's going on, putting this together, building your game, having a vision. You're going to be six two, a buck 90. You, you got to have the vision of where this little kid's going to be. And I explained this to the, to the parents. Um, and it's like, it, it's hard sometimes because they, they don't understand the physicality and the ups and downs and the journey uh, of this whole thing, but it's very, very expensive tennis. That's why it's much easier. I tell our body, you know, to pick up a ball and go start shooting jump shots or run outside and tackle your neighbor because the technical part, not that it's not that, you know, detailed in basketball or football. It's just, that's where the athletes are going. Okay. Uh, if I'd have had LeBron James, at 10 years old, there's no doubt I could have made him number one in the world. And that's nothing about me. I'm not trying to be like that. It's just that I would have put, you know, a Federer forehand and a Djokovic backhand and erotic serve on a guy 6'8 that could jump over the rainbow and just wants to knock you out. He would have brought a different athlete. We talk of Medvedev and Sampras or Djokovic or now Alcarez, who I've done a lot of stuff on lately these amazing athletes that are not from the United States, this would have been a whole different type of person. Yep. LeBron and, right. and put a racket in his hand, but we, we don't, we don't get those. And this country doesn't want to find that needle in the haystack. And I've been preaching that sermon to him for 30 years. How, so, so stick with that point. How do you, how does the tennis world find the LeBron James? How do they, how do you attract the elite of the elite raw athletes but instead of them picking up a basketball or picking up a football or whatever it is they come pick up a tennis racket that's venus and serena williams just world-class athletes i'm sure venus and serena they probably could have been good at a dozen sports yeah. whichever sport their father decided to put them in at eight years old i'm sure they would have been great at right same thing with lebron same thing with a lot of these guys nadal like 
how do we, what is it about American culture that we don't put our best young athletes in tennis? Um, first off, great question. And you know, I've answered that probably 800 times of course. over my career. You know, it, it's, it's always been a problem. They, the USTA, uh, which in a lot of ways probably does a, a good job, uh, they'd rather do this shotgun approach, give some people opportunities. We get good athletes. Francis Tiafo, uh, Sebastian Corda could be, you know, win some grand slams. He's the next great American, in my opinion. But both his parents, I mean, one played on the tour. Both of them played on the tour. Both his sisters are pro golfers. I mean, that's genetic, you know, lottery yeah. right there, you know, and he has a good demeanor so he can handle pressure. So, but they don't want to find the needle in the haystack. I told him, here's the deal. You got to roll the dice. It's a crapshoot. Six, seven, eight, nine years old. You can even test. Uh, you can draw blood just like they do in the Olympics. You can find out how quick people are, fast twitch muscle. You can how tall people are going to be. You can measure all this stuff. Why do something for someone who's going to be a turtle? Or why do something for someone that's an average athlete? Say they have great strokes. They're going to be limited. You know, you want to put it on a thoroughbred that's going to knock you out. All right. And so you find these athletes when they're young and you put all the you put money into it and you get them with whether it be a Rick Macy or whoever. And you, you get the best biomechanical technical base. OK, because let's face it, the cards you're dealt with at a young age, they're with you forever. The hole shrinks as you get bigger, but the hole is still a hole. OK, you're going to have that same hole forever. And. Especially tennis, forehand, backhand, serve. Those are the big ticket items. And you just be technically sound. I've seen people with holes on their game, whether they hold the racket wrong, it costs them millions of dollars. And I don't mean one or two, I mean 10 to 20. It's ruined careers, strokes, all right, where it's a little different maybe in the team sports. But they that's what I would do. I would put it on people that are so quick and so fast. Now, that segues into Alcaraz. I call, I call this kid Alcatraz because he puts everybody in prison. I don't call him Alcaraz. <laughs> this guy is a generational player. He's going to be number one in the world. Barring injury, he'll go down as the greatest ever. And he hadn't won anything yet. I'm just telling you, this kid, he has makeup speed from outer space. Once he starts, he's the fastest guy ever to pick up a racket. And he has such a mature, complete game. But Greg, he has humility, his upbringing his appreciation. He eats pressure for breakfast and he he's a showman. He was meant to do this. He checks all these boxes and I could see that coming two years ago. And now he just beat Nat Nadal and Djokovic and Zara back to back and won Madrid and he's 18. Uh, there's wow. something, there's something there. So my point is the USTA, you got to find a needle a haystack, but here's the next thing. When you came out of high school, I don't know how many people thought, well, that guy's good. That guy's great. This guy can be good. Evaluating talent is in the eye of the beholder. And I tell people all the time, you know, what you may see is different than Rick may see, you know, whether I'm evaluating a football player or basketball. So even those six, seven, eight year olds, you can test this, but you got to project and you got to put the environment into it and the parents, you know, it's, you're not going to be right all the time. You're hedging your bet. I guarantee we would dominate American tennis if this was done, but it's not because the kids, it's, it's too expensive. Yeah. We're getting good athletes. We don't get the best. What, what would you say to the people on the other side of the argument who say that's too much, too young, they're too, it's too early, it's too intense, we can't be starting to pick kids sports at 10, 12 years old. How do we know what they're going to mature? How do we know what they're going to love? Let them play everything. We'll decide what they're going to play more seriously later in life. That, that whole kind of sports specialization conversation comes up more so in the, in the team sports arena. I know kids in, in tennis and golf pretty, you know, pretty much get into those sports at a young age if you have any chance of becoming you know, a, a high-level competitor in that regard. So like, what, what do you say to those people who say, no, I don't want to test my 10-year-old kid to see how big he's going to be, to see how fast he runs, to determine whether or not he should pick up a tennis racket or if he should go play golf or if he should go play basketball. No, I agree with that. I think it's a great argument. You know, let's just go back in time. You see Tiger Woods hitting a golf ball at three. Yep. 
that guy has a lot of potential. I think he'll be good someday, you know? So, <laughs> I, you know, I could, I could push the other way. And I, of course. I think you should be exposed to every possible sport. I'm sure you were, and you're just going to, you're going to gravitate. But if someone is not exposed to tennis, which they probably wouldn't be, you know, an inner city kid or whoever, they don't have the cheddar. They're not going to even know. You know, and then they get around someone like myself or whoever who can motivate them. And you just, I, I, it's just, I don't mean to say this is easy, but it's easier when you got the thoroughbred to win the derby and you got to expose them to all these different sports. I'm all for that. And that's okay. And that's what life's about, you know, making choices, winning, failing, succeeding. But you get them exposed to tennis. And if they don't want to do it, you don't want them doing it anyways. Of course. Like yeah. you said earlier, like you gotta anything else. All, you got to be all in. Yeah, it's I don't like anything. I, listen, I, don't, and you're allowed to change your mind. That That's that's okay, too. Yeah, it's so <laughs> true. So with all that being said, how do you keep your young kids, you know, you, you, that word burnout gets thrown, at, or gets thrown around a lot. How do you keep your young kids who are, you know, competing five or six times a week, multiple times per day, competitive environment. They're challenging themselves. They're getting challenged by other elite players at their level, their age. How do you keep those kids that are so all in at such a young age from burning out, from saying I've had enough? Like, what is that balance that you are able to find and makes and makes your academy so so successful that you can continue these kids on these long arcs where halfway through they don't say, you know what? I'm tired of this. I, I, I'm done. Yeah, you're going to you're going to always have that. You know, it's the art of communication, you know, how to say it, when to say it, why to say it. It's it's constant communication. The end game. The worst thing is I'm going to college for free. You know, it's a journey. Um, I, it, I know this sounds funny. The kids usually that I've been around my whole career, they don't burn out. It's the parents that burn out. The parents, you know, the kid gets 15. She looks different. People look at her different. She has a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a driver's <laughs> license. You know, the mom and dad, they're, they're, they used to be in the front row. Now they're going towards the back row. You know, they're, they're, they're going yeah. the other way. And, you know, it, where when you're daddy's little girl or, you know, your son, when you got that eight to 13, you're, you're there. And then you, and the, so the parents are realizing, you know, my kid's not going to Wimbledon. I might be watching it. They're not going to be playing. But the kids don't burn out that much. They, they lo- might lose the passion, and that's okay. Because if you're not in, you're out. But that doesn't mean you can't get a great college scholarship and get a great education and be part of a team and stuff like that. So, But I've never had anybody just game, set, match, I'm out of here, unless they've had a catastrophic injury and right. they couldn't play anymore. Um, it's the art of communication. And I'll go back to how we started the podcast. It's fun. You got to keep them in a fun environment and every day motivating them, you know, uh, no matter what, even if they do something bad, there's a way to say it in a positive way to get your point across. And, you know, instead of just keep beating on someone, I get it. You got to be truthful and you got to be honest with them and you got to, but you got to be careful doing that all the time. And you got to know who you're doing it with. Like your kids, you have to treat them all a little different, even though you love them the same. Because one of them can take a punch a little more, you know, and, uh, you know, I was I could talk to Serena a little different than maybe Venus. Roddick, I could do whatever I wanted. He just said, bring it on, man. You know, he, he would come <laughs> right back at me. But, but a boy's different than a girl. You know, I, I do it very differently. So but they don't really burn out. But it's the job of the coach. I'll go back to it. You're hired. Not to let them burn out. I'll yeah. flip it the other way. That's what you're getting paid to do. You're hired to make them have a great attitude. You're hired to make them compete better. You're hired. Now, the parents think they'll win more, but the, you can't always judge success in winning and losing. No question. Now, I, didn't, I didn't pick up a racket till I was 12. No one taught me how to play, but I know how to compete. And by 18, I was number one in the Ohio Valley. And people are going, what is this all about? You know. So I get it from the old school, and that's still a part of makes me more diverse in how to handle all these cast of characters. Yeah. Winning is a byproduct. Yeah. Winning is a byproduct of doing things the right way. Absolutely. All the time. You, it doesn't guarantee success, but it gives your likelihood of having regular success, success and sustained success 
your likelihood's a lot higher. And that's the message we always try to tell my kids, our team, kids on the team. Like, there's no guarantee you're going to get a base hit every time. But I'll tell you what, if you get up there in a bad stance and a bad attitude and a bad, and you're not, and you're not up there aggressive and you're up there half ass, I bet you more times than not, you're going to have a bad, you're going to have a bad at bat. Now you get up there with a great stance and a great approach and a confident, clear mind, and you're doing all the things you work on. You could still strike out. It doesn't guarantee success, but I'll tell you what, you might as well give your chance yourself every chance you can to be successful by just doing it the right way. So I, I'm with you on that. The wins and losses to me are a byproduct of all the decisions and choices you make. Absolutely. And real quick, you know, I, I, listen, I got, I got more stories than any storyteller. You have no idea, all positive. And I tell the kids, it's all about Pete Sampras. You know, I'm at the, I'm at the Easter bowl. I mean, I didn't coach him, um, but I'm at the Easter bowl and he's playing somebody and the kids, uh, you know, 14, I think Sampras is 13. The kid he's playing already has a mustache and a beard. Sampras didn't even have any hair on his face. He's serving and volleying. He looked good, but he got carved up like a Thanksgiving turkey. All right. It was like 6'1, 6'2. And I told the guy from Alesse, it's a clothing company. I said, Who is that kid? And he goes, His name is such and such from Michigan. I go, No, no, no. That was the number one seed. This other guy, he goes, Oh, he's not that good. He has a weak backhand. And, but the guy was coming to the net all the time making all the right moves, getting lobbed, but he looked like he knew what he was doing and he moved on eggshells the way this kid moved. I said, that kid's the best kid in the tournament. He lost one and two, second round the Orange Bowl. You know, five years later, he wins the U.S. Open. The other guy played one at Michigan, got the 180 in the world, nothing to sneeze about. The other became Sampras and the other was just uh, an All-American Wolverine. So this, I got all these stories like, that he was making positive errors he was losing because the other guy was a man at 14 almost he was a little boy his you know and he wasn't as competitive maybe there's all these things and so i'm able to bring out these stories that are all true and factual about famous people who when they were young they weren't that good yep Generally speaking, any, any of the, any of the guys, this last few things, I'm going to let you go. Any, anybody that you've personally coached, you know, Sharapova, the Williams sisters, who, who would you say was the one when they were younger? You were like, okay, I can, they're not winning now. They're not the dominant 12 year old. They're not the dominant 14 year old, but there's just something about this kid. And then lo and behold, they go on to be one of those household names. Is there one that pops off and pops off at you? Well, you know, like Roddy, if someone would have told me when I had him, he was number one. You'll like this story. He was number one in the nation as a 12 year old. He came to me at nine. I coached his brother, John. He was like two in the nation, all American at Georgia. Roddick was one in the nation in 12s. I'm glad you're sitting down. You ready for this? He lost to Drew Brees. It's unbelievable. I, I, I know you people don't know Drew played. So you could imagine what type of athlete Drew was, but he beat Andy, uh, uh, it's like, he's from the Midwest. He's from Indiana or somewhere. Anyways, then Roddy was like 14 in the 14s and 16 in the nation, in the 16s. Then he was one in the world in the 18s. He grew seven inches. His serve become nuclear. Therefore his forehand became supersonic. So he, I knew he'd be a great pro. What I thought he'd win the U S open at 19, even though it was his only grand slam or be number one. No way. I, I wouldn't have thought it. But he became six two, you know, bucks eighty. He was only he was always this little shrimp mosquito. But every time he lost, the next day he was right in my face. I want to play him again. He always came back for the battle. He loved the competition. His thirst for competition was like no other. The guy was brutal, and I had him and his brother playing doubles against Venus and Serena because Andy and Serena same age. It was like a Compton street fight. Good old <laughs> Texas boys versus Compton. They, an older John knew how to play, but it was just a fight and they hated each other. It was just so, and they all laugh about it now because we're all older, but it was crazy. So it'd be Who Rod, would win? Who huh? would win? Who would win? Uh, the boys would win. Uh, but if but, you ask, but Ser- I'm sure the Williams sisters could hang in there, right? They'd hang. But if you ask Serena, she's undefeated and she still has a loss <laughs> to this day. I, I mean, love she, that. She just ran out of time, but it'd be Serena. Because, and I know, I told her this. I thought Venus would be better initially. Serena was a prankster, Greg. 
She, I say, move your feet. She go, why? Okay, but she was 10. You know, and I got to tell this story. This is like, I've told this to other people. It was the middle of July, um, 110. Uh, we're on a court training. Venus on one court, Shereen on another. And a, a lizard would come across the court. He couldn't even make it to the other side. He died. That's how hot it was. So Serena's out there with the hitting partner. I go, meet. I, her name, Serena Jamika Williams. Um, I go, meet. I never called her Serena. I go, you got to move your feet. She goes, why? I said, you told me you want to be number one. Now, remember, she's 11. And she goes, I will be number one. And I said, well, what do I got to do to get you to move your feet? Richard wasn't there. Okay, he was off somewhere. So, and he goes, she goes, Rick, I'm really hungry. Can you have Scott go to the snack machine? Get me some hot curly fries, a Snickers bar, a Pepsi. And on the way to work, daddy drove by a stand. I want one of those Green Day t-shirts. And I go, wait a minute. So if I get to Snickers bar, the curly fries, the Pepsi, and Scott gets you the Green Day t-shirt, you got to move your feet? She goes, Rick, you see that tall, skinny girl over there? That was Venus. Venus was like built like that. She goes, I'll make her look slower than molasses. So I had Scott go get the Snickers bar, the curly fries, the Pepsi. I said, Scott, on the way to work on Linton Boulevard, get a green, Serena Green Day t-shirt. He brings all the stuff back. She goes under the canopy. She has her snack. Listen to this. For one hour straight, she's hitting with a guy 450 in the world. He played one for Congo, Davis Cup, whatever that means. But he was good. They're ripping ground strokes down the line, cross court. One hour straight, popping the popcorn, extra butter, the feet nonstop, no water, sweats coming off this little girl like Niagara Falls. It gets to be 315. I'm on the other court now with Venus because they were side by side. Because, hey, Rick, I'm done. It's 315, and you better have that Green Day t shirt here in the morning. <laughs> now, you got to remember that's that attitude, that pit bull that you saw at the US Open. And that's why she's went down as the greatest ever. It's that inside. See, I like that stuff, especially on a female athlete. Give me a break. Okay. And this is, that, this is what I, uh, so, but that was a competitive, but a lot of times she was just not there because she wasn't mature. But when she got 13 or 14, and you've seen this in football, Serena had all the time in the world. And that's another thing when you talk about evaluating talent. Serena had all the time in the world. It looked like she could order lunch before she had a ball. Venus, I didn't see that. And when you have all the time, you have options. When we have options, you can play offense, defense. So that's an intangible that when I talk like that, people didn't know what I was talking about. But I saw that in her besides the pit bull and the speed and the body. And then obviously she was taught the technical. So first off, great question. But for all the viewers, and when I show videotape, to every parent of Venus and Serena when they're 10 and 11, every single parent has said the same thing. And we're talking tens of thousands. My kids are better than that. Because they hard. look at they look <laughs> at the outside. They look at where they start and not they where did, they finish. They, they couldn't look under the hood. And that's why I took the chance. It was under the hood that I saw that box was checked. And that was from birth all the way to age 10 when they met Rick Macy. I, that's yeah. what I saw. Yep. All right, I got one more question for you. These are questions that we ask all of our guests. I'm just going to ask you one because I think it's super. I think your perspective on it's going to be great before we let you go again. Rick, thank you so much for, for joining us. This has been just, I could listen to your stories for four hours, but I know you have kids to train. So the, the one I'm going to ask you before we go, what, what would be your piece of advice that you would give parents today as they navigate this world of youth sports? Um, first off, let the child uh, be exposed to everything. Okay. Every sport, you know, don't pigeonhole them. Don't, don't do it because that's what you want or that's what you did. Okay. This isn't cookie cutter. It's not cloning. Introduce them to everything. Let them find their own niche. Okay. Um, let them find their own passion and it might change, you know, it might change. Um, I always thought I'd be a pro golfer, you know, when I grew up, it's, it's going to change. So. That would be the first thing. Make them the best athlete you can. Expose them to anything. The repetitions can come later on when they get like 11, 12. But early on, I would expose them to everything. Make them the best athlete they can. And as a parent, your job, remember, they're going to always look at you as mom and dad. You got to be careful. When you start getting into that, you better be a psychologist. 
You better know how to push buttons because this can create tremendous family problems. It can create divorce, ruin vacations. This thing could be a nightmare on Elm Street if you get so wrapped up into it. And you want to be always encouraging, honest with your kids. Don't sugarcoat it and be honest with them. Okay. And I think when you're honest, it goes both ways. It's going to add more value when you're when you're the other way. You just can't say, don't worry about it, or you can't just always be negative and criticized. Um, and remember, it's a long-term process. So that's what I would tell the parents that, you know, get their kids into this. Um, and most of all, the game of life is bigger than any game your kid's going to play. And the life lessons you're going to learn through failing. Okay. And some people say, well, Rick, my kid needs to win. And I said, okay, I'll get him to beat someone tomorrow and I'll see the exact same problems, but you might feel good at dinner and it might taste better that night. Then we get up the next day and it's raining again. So right. I get all that stuff, but listen, Venus never won a match, Greg, in three and a half years at the Academy. You know, if they don't lose, a, they don't win a match in three weeks. They're going somewhere else. Yeah. Hey, I'm, I'm not doing my job. Richard wanted that. And uh, so it's, it's almost backwards. You, you want them to toughen up and you want them to fail and fail. And listen, if it ruins their confidence, it, it wasn't meant to be anyways. You got to You got to do things on your own. Some people don't have a mom. Some people don't have a dad. You know, some people they're I just got to did a Zoom the other day. I said, listen, I'm with a management company. I said, this girl's the toughest girl you've you I've looked at the last year. And they said, it's funny you said that. Her dad was a cop and he got his leg shot off. And he's looking at his, her dad the last 10 years with one leg. This girl is such an amazing competitor. And I'm not saying that I know that's hardcore stuff, but these the, the real world, most parents don't understand the real world. And I'm sure you got a zillion stories from a lot of guys that played football at the, at the U yeah. and more, you know, how they grew up and, yeah. you, know, you know, that's the, the real world is hard, man. Yeah, the no, real okay. world is hard. And the <laughs> earlier you get your kids to understand that, the better. Especially well, nowadays, I, now, especially nowadays, because there's too many, everybody's a little entitled and there's a lot of social media crap and people. So your, your kid has to be, be tough, but you can do this and still have a lot of humility. Well, Rick, I, I, I can't thank you enough. Your, your perspective, your experience, your, your stories, just whether it's coaching the kids or dealing with the parents, I just think is such, is just such great advice is just great, such great insight for, for our show and our purpose here on you think. So I thank you so much um, for your time, for your, for your energy, your stories are amazing. So wish you nothing but the best. And uh, I've taken up a little tennis now. I'm not ready for the Rick Macy, $800 an hour, but I got a pretty decent forehand. My backhand sucks, but uh, it's been, I've never picked up a racket until last summer. So this is like a post career. Yeah. If, you're your family, for me. if you're your family's ever in Florida and you're near Boca, just stop by and look me up. Done. I would love that. That sounds great. Thank you so much, Rick. I really All appreciate right. I it. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Rick. All right, everybody, welcome back. Uh, I hope you guys all really enjoyed that episode, that conversation with Rick Macy, uh, the storytelling, the perspective. I mean, how many people out there are coaching not only at the elite level, you know, some of the most world-class athletes that we know, household names, but are also starting the journey with a lot of these athletes at four, five, six years old. I mean, it, tennis and golf and more of the, the those, you know, sort of academy-based sports just seem to be so unique. It reminds me, a little bit of our conversation with Sean Johnson, um, you know, a little bit more of the, the Olympic kind of pathway. I, I just found the conversation super eye opening that, that so many families are, are making these decisions at such a young age and calling him to drop off their six year old, their eight year old, you know, even 10 year old and, 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 and set them on this journey to, you know, like in the words of Rick, you know, at the, at the bare minimum, I'm going to get you a college scholarship, but obviously the goals are a lot higher. I just, I find that to be such a fascinating world. And I, and I think his voice and, and experience, and, and of course his stories are, uh, are super eye opening. So I, I hope you guys all enjoyed that conversation with Rick Macy. And as we always do at this point, we're going to bring in my producer, Tasha, who, uh, as always is going to have a mix of, of some audience questions, which Every week, uh, we're going to try to get to as many of them as we can. Uh, we love hearing from you guys. We love kind of taking the conversation where you guys would like to go, and uh, and also bringing up some of the hot the hot button topics uh, 
that are going on, articles and things on the internet that uh, that we feel are super relevant. So, Tasha, what's happening? What's up? Yeah, this actually came up in our show group chat not too long ago, which relates great to Rick. A few weeks ago, a New York Times article came out last week stating that tennis academies are now recruiting preteens, which gives them access to representatives from the pro tours and Nike and access to having agents that early and that young. Um, I guess, Greg, how do you know if this opportunity is right for parents? Like these are preteens, they're younger. It means specialization at a very early age. Yeah, you know, I, I think that. this one's tricky. And and I asked Rick, um, you know, in the interview, I said, you know, Rick, ha, you know, you talk about specialization, you talk about exposing all the kids to everything, but at the same time, you have the kids out on the court for six hours a day, seven hours mm-hmm. a day plus school. There's really no time to do anything. And and I thought his I thought his insight was really interesting. And 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 he, you know, he said, listen, the certain only certain families are willing to make this sacrifice and willing to make this commitment. So typically, not only is the family all in, but the hopefully the athlete, the kid. Um, they're all in too. I think in regards to this New York Times article that you're referencing, you know, I think like anything, I, I, I think there's going to be the example of the of the 10 year old kid who's dropped off at one of these academies and he goes down this entire road and and he becomes the number one player in the world. And he signed with Nike at 10 years old. And then at 18 years old, he goes off and joins the pro tour. And it's like a it's a Hollywood story. They write movies about these kids, right? It's mm. it's the next King Richard. But then I think for every one of those examples, for every single 10 year old kid who signs the big deal and and it's LeBron James, right? LeBron James is on the cover of Sports Illustrated. He's the golden child. He's the next kid. And then what are the chances that he actually turns out to be arguably one of the top one or two basketball players of all time, right? That that story is had every opportunity to go the other way. We've seen it so many times. So I'd say the same thing here, like for every time it works and every time that representative gets that that kid at an early age and they get on this track and it actually turns to them being a big time international tennis superstar. How many kids is it going to ruin, right? Right. How many kids are going to be exposed to the money, to the greed? How many families are going to take advantage of them? How many coaches or, you know, representatives, agents, whatever you want to call them that are going to manipulate and exploit these young kids. And all of a sudden they're going to ruin what could have been a really good journey. So I, I would not, if this was my kid, I don't care how talented my kid would be. I I would not put him into this situation where he's dealing about the business side of sports. And we've covered that a lot here on you think. And I, and I know, right. If I'm sitting, listening at home, I'm saying, well, it's easy for you. Olson, your kid doesn't need the money. You can send your kid. What if my kid, the only way for him to get this level of training is to take Nike money is to go to one of these academies and kind of enter into the, you know, the business side of, of sports at such a young age. Cause without it, he doesn't have the access. And, and I understand that. I think there's going to be there's going to be examples of that happening too, where if they don't go this route, there is no alternative, right? We see it. Kids go to IMG. We see kids taking this route in other sports. So I think this is going to be something for us to keep our eye on here. I think this is going to be a story that is not even close to being told in its entirety. Uh, personally, I would not sign my kid up for it, but I understand my kids have have other options. So how every parent navigates this uh, this space, I think, is going to be very interesting to see, but. I just get so worried, Tasha, exposing 10, 12, I mean, pre-teens, you know, you're talking 10, 12 year olds, boys and girls to a really dark side of the sport at such an early age. Yeah. It creates a whole pressure situation for young kids too. And like we saw the things with like Naomi Osaka and all this, it's just, it's a lot of responsibility for a young kid. I couldn't agree Um, more. I think it's a lot for them to burden. I think youth sports, we, again, We've talked, we've touched on it a lot here and I've, I've given my, my fair share of personal perspective. Youth sports are stressful to begin with. Now, all mm-hmm. of a sudden my Nike deal is on the line. My spot in this Academy is on the line. If I, if I don't perform in this week's tournament, what if they replace me? What if I, how, how are yeah. we going to ask 10, 12 year old kids to internalize all of that and not turn out to be monsters? I, I just, I think that's a really, really slippery slope that I think we just, again, we got to keep an eye on it and see in which direction it continues to, to head. Mm -hmm. Well, going off of that a little bit, one of our audience questions this week is they wanted you to react to this statement. And the statement is the people who deal with the brunt of family drama is the youth sports leagues. What's your take on that? I I think that's a really interesting insight. I I think, you know, when we have Dr. Gervais back on here, I think he might be a little bit more inclined to, to speak on that. That seems to be a pretty deep kind of psychological, kind of a social type 
of a question. I think just from from my you know kind of higher level view, by no means am I a psychologist or a sociologist, but you know I, I do think that a lot of the drama that we see taken out at ball fields and a lot of the drama that we see conflict with coaches or conflict with with other parents, I think is parents internalizing a lot of their own stresses. And then that's just the outlet that it's seen publicly, right? I think you mm. you go to the game with your own harbored anxieties, whether it's anxieties related to how your kid's playing, his position on the team, you know, is he going to make it or whatever it is, or it could be something completely unrelated. Maybe there's some drama going on in your household unrelated to the sports scene. But now all of a sudden that the, the game, the, the, the practice, the tournament brings this competitive juice, this competitive energy where now all these emotions have the forum to kind of beyond display. So I'm sure there's a little bit of that for sure. And, and you know, it, what's going on in the home has no, has no real chance of not spilling over, you know, into these high stress environments of, of the youth sporting events or the tournaments or whatever you're at. So, yeah, I think that's a really, really, you know, really cool observation by, by one of our audience members to kind of submit that because yeah, I think refs take the brunt of it. Coaches take the brunt of it. Just, people have a, a weird way of showing their emotions and people have a, a weird yeah. way of, of harboring, of harboring anxieties and, and taking them out on what would be seen as completely irrelevant. People need healthier ways to release emotions than on <laughs> referees and youth sports. No, listen, like, why trust is me, that I've the got, place? I've gotten fired up at youth sporting events. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it, it gets intense. <laughs> Your kids out there, they're battling. You're trying to encourage them, but you're also trying to correct them. And you're trying, listen, I get it, man. These, these sporting events get, get intense. But at the end of the day, at least in my, in my experience, like the sports are intense for their own right and in their own bubble. Mm -hmm. And when it's over, it's over. I'm not, I'm not carrying like external factors into my kid's 10 year old baseball game, but I'm sure some people are. Yeah. Maybe they just need to take like a Pilates class or a boxing class or something. I don't know. Maybe before the practice. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, the next audience question says, should coaches go through certification programs like other jobs? We see this sometimes, um, but some coaches don't have to. Yeah. I actually think coach certification is probably one of the biggest issues facing youth sports today because there really is no clear cut pathway. There is no real certification program or system that's set up that's universal that we can coach, we can teach coaches, you know, a lot of the things that we cover here, right? How to hold the practice, how to deal with and communicate with families, how to set expectations, how to deal with disgruntled player or parent. You know, there's so many factors both related to the sport, but also so many factors unrelated to the sport that go into your job as being the coach. And 99% of these coaches at the youth level, especially at the younger ages and the rec programs and whatnot, are volunteers. They're moms and dads who are volunteering their time for the betterment of not only their kid, but in most cases for the, you know, the majority of the other kids get the bulk of their time, which is time they could have been spending one-on-one -on -one with their child. So I think certification is an issue. I, I think finding some way for these organizations or whether the, you know, the parent organizations, whether it's, you know, USA football or whether it's USA baseball or, you know, all these kind of parent programs that sit up at the top how do they downstream to all these rec programs and travel ball associations that fall within their sports category? How do they somehow systematically implement training, orientation, you know, tools, you know, whether it's videos, whether it's flyers, whether it's emails weekly or whatever it is, hmm. how can we better equip these often volunteers, parents to give a better opportunity and a better experience for all of our kids who are playing for them in their, you know, in their respective sports. I, I think that's a huge issue that is a very difficult one to, to tackle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think a certification program would be a good thing, but yeah, the implementation part of it is kind of tricky. Yeah. I think it but. sounds great. I, I think we would all sign up for it. I just think now who, who determines what, how to train a good coach. There's, there's a lot of ways to skin it, right? There's a lot of people who think coaches need to be one thing. And a lot of people who want coaches to be another, you know, it's, hmm. there, it's, it's not easy. So when you start kind of making those cookie cutter assumptions, you're never going to get everyone to feel aligned that that's the best direction for them. And then that opens up a whole new can of worms. So like anything, yeah. um, it, it, it all sounds, it all sounds great in theory, but it's always very difficult in practice. That's true. Well, that's everything with the fan questions we have this week. And you guys can keep submitting fan questions and Greg will answer them on Youth Inc. or at Greg Olson on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. 
And as always, thank you guys so much for uh, listening in. Tasha, appreciate you joining us as always. Please rate, review, subscribe, wherever you get your podcasts. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys next week. Thanks. Thanks.